Thank you for the introduction. So for this evening, I'll start uh, sort of for the first phase of this uh, review and update on uh, current and expanding uh, applications to treat essential tremor with a focus on deep brain stimulation. Uh, Elizabeth will follow me and discuss uh, an area uh, of mutual interest, uh, a research interest that uh, we've uh, uh, embarked on together uh, since we both started here uh, a little bit less than a year ago. So uh, uh, I'll start with a, a little bit of a quick focus on uh, current treatments for essential tremor, and then I'll move into other standard of care, but slightly more invasive options for more severe cases. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, fun ways to also consider treatments for essential tremor. Uh, and then we'll transition into Elizabeth's talk. So uh, as most of you know, and it's nice to have such a full house here, and I assume some of you either have essential tremor or know somebody with essential tremor. Uh, if not, it's the most common neurological condition uh, in this country, though it's a spectrum. So just about anybody would have some aspect of tremor. That doesn't mean you have essential tremor. Uh, I'm not a neurologist, but it takes a very rigorous uh, evaluation to properly diagnose essential tremor. Uh, but the truth is, uh, as, as you age, more people and more people develop essential tremor such that it becomes such a common condition. There are reports of even 30% of adults have some aspect of this disorder. And we joke about our tremor and coffee-inducing tremor. That's a very mild tremor, but it can actually interfere with quality of life. Can you imagine what a severe tremor can do for yourself? We typically think of tremor in our arm, maybe in our head. We'll find out later that there's also tremor in your voice. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, some more of that uh, in a bit. The current treatments for essential tremor typically are propranolol, primidone. These are medications. Gabapentin is a new popular medication. For mild tremor, these are decent options. For moderate tremor, they could help. But for severe tremor, they're generally not sufficient to provide good quality of life. So that's where a surgeon uh, or a surgery consult comes in. And uh, most of the patients I see tend to have a severe essential tremor, uh, or at least essential tremor that was at one point well controlled by medications, uh, uh, but no longer either related to side effects or just worsening in, in their condition. So uh, of course, I get to see the most difficult of cases. Uh, the best option for these patients are reversible but yet invasive procedures, and we'll be talking about deep brain stimulation specifically. This is a technique that's rooted in a surgical application that was developed in the early 1900s called stereotaxis. It relies on an MRI scan that informs our surgeons on exactly where in the brain are, for example, the tremor cells. And we use this kind of surgical mapping technique to target other brain regions for maybe Parkinson's disease or epilepsy, even psychiatric disorders. But the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus, which is deep in the brain, is the main center for essential tremor. There are others, but that is the main FDA-approved indication for essential tremor, uh, uh, specifically targeting it with deep brain stimulation and other kinds of stereotactic procedures. You can imagine when this was first developed, it was quite primitive almost cruel to put a, a human being in a device like this that almost looks like a cage. Uh, but this was the only way at that time, this is probably in the mid-1900s, that we were able to target small regions in the brain with decent precision. As things develop, this is the Lexell frame. This is probably the most commonly used stereotactic device to help ensure that we're targeting very small regions of the brain very accurately, either with an electrode or a laser. Can you believe we're actually doing laser surgery now? Uh, not yet for a central tremor, but that's uh, another talk for another night. Uh, but it's just a means to get to a small region of the brain. Uh, so this is one, uh, one technique that surgeons have used. And uh, earlier in my training, it was a technique that I uh, developed a lot of uh, familiarity with. So this is a patient sitting in the operating room. What you can't see behind this patient's head is that this frame is actually locked to the operating room table. And he's also awake, as you can also tell. So for most of these operations, patients are awake, especially if we're targeting the thalamus for essential tremor. Uh, we need feedback from the patient as the electrode's placed in order to confirm that there's no side effects from the stimulation, uh, also that there's good effectiveness uh, 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 of our uh, surgical target. Uh, so not only are you awake, but you're also locked into the operating room table. 
the advances that we have made, and actually uh, here at Stanford, these advances were made by uh, my, uh, one of my partners, uh, here, Jamie Henderson, uh, who's a, a faculty member here in neurosurgery. He contributed to the development of a device called the Next Frame. There are other devices like this now, but this is just one example of a device that we like to use that not only provides us with a precision and the accuracy to uh, uh, provide a safe and effective surgery for patients, but also a surgery that is much more comfortable. And you can see this individual is resting on a pillow. Uh, yet our surgeries are still uh, accurate, precise, safe, and even faster than they were five, ten years ago. So these developments are relatively recent. I've developed um, the, the use of the next frame in my practice uh, over the past couple of years, and it has dramatically improved my surgeries, my outcomes, uh, and I find patients are also more satisfied. So uh, yes, the comfort of the patient uh, provides an advantage for this uh, surgery because you're awake. And so if you have to be awake for a couple of hours to provide the surgeon and the neurologist with input on how well the stimulation is doing for you, you're going to want to be comfortable because if you have to lie on a rigid bed with your head fixed for a couple of hours, that's not going to be something patients are going to sign up for. Uh, we want this to be a good experience for you. Uh, so when I actually started here at Stanford, my, my partner took me on a tour uh, uh, of the uh, surgical uh, suite, and he showed me our Lexal frame, and I said, wow, you know, that's uh, not really something that I'd like to put to use. So uh, will you, would you teach me how to use this uh, frameless technique? And that's exactly what we've done. And so we've uh, together developed this frameless program where patients are able to get these surgeries and uh, they're able to get them faster uh, with a lot more comfort during the procedure. I'll give you a little bit of information on how we get you to the operating room. So uh, there's a lot of evaluation that's done, obviously, by the neurology team. Uh, my partner in ENT, Elizabeth, does a lot of the evaluations for the vocal tremor patients. Uh, right before the surgery, so we skipped a lot of steps, right before the surgery, patients come in and we place these little markers actually in the skull. It's almost like a dental procedure. You, he you hear a little drill. Um, usually a patient and their family members in the room, and it's very well tolerated. It's almost painless. Uh, but these little markers are used during the surgery uh, because we get a CAT scan with those markers in place. So we're able to actually precisely measure distances from those markers to deep brain structures, and that's how we're able to get such incredible accuracy. And the accuracy that we're able to achieve is less than one millimeter, within one millimeter of error. So that's quite, quite good. And we know within that level of accuracy, we'll have incredible efficacy, incredible effectiveness. Some of the software that we use basically takes a CAT scan and merges it to an MRI scan because we get different information from both of these different studies. Plenty of my patients say, well, I just got an MRI. Why do I have to get a CAT scan? And vice versa. I just got a CAT scan. Why do I need to get an MRI? And the truth is these aren't diagnostic studies. These are studies that we're using for a surgical procedure, and they both give us vital information in order to ensure a good result. So this is actually part of the procedure here. So you can see those little markers that are placed in the scalp. I don't think this is too much for people to stomach, but, um, um, but this is the real deal. Uh, uh, this is a, a procedure where we actually reference these skull markers to an MRI scan with a little camera, the patient's actual MRI scan. And this allows us to do these surgeries under actual, essentially real-time MRI guidance, though we're not actually in the tube of an MRI scanner. We bring the MRI to you, essentially. So here's where we're planning to make a small incision. It's usually about two or three centimeters in size. All of this fun animation. So uh, once we make incision, we take this small little tower device. And this gets temporarily implanted actually into the skull with tiny little screws about the size of a millimeter. Uh, this is painless, but it provides us an opportunity to have a uh, a, 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 a motion device that with MRI guidance we're able to actually almost like a joystick develop the kind of accuracy that we're trying to get. Without this kind of device we can get an electrode into eh, pretty close into the region where we kind of want to be but we that's not acceptable to us. We want to be within one millimeter of our planned target so this type of swivel device is able to give us that kind of precision. The procedure basically you can see the little target in the center, the, the, the little circle, the goal is really to bring that large sphere over to that circle and overlap them. And we know when we do that, we have less than 0.5 millimeters of error in our target. And that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, this is uh, 
something that people that use other kinds of primitive frames would have dreamed to be able to do. So this is uh, a real incredible development. We use a microdrive system. This is a, a device that can slowly lower an electrode into the brain. And this is both for the ability to record from the brain. So we actually listen. We convert the electrical signals of the brain to an audible signal that you can hear. So we can actually listen to the cells in the brain that we think are involved in tremor and then implant the electrode in that location. This microdrive is also able to lower the electrode to that point in such a way I like to describe it that if you were to watch the electrode, you wouldn't be able to tell it was moving. That's how slowly it moves. And again, this is safety. This is precision, um, uh, the kind of surgery that when you're questioning whether you want to have surgery or just stay on your medications and have poor quality of life but not have brain surgery, this is the kind of surgery where I feel that patients might say, you know what, that sounds like something that is safe and rigorous, and since it's going to help me, I think it's worth trying. So the electrodes that we place are about a millimeter in size and diameter. It's a long, thin wire. It's always confusing when people talk about the electrode. When I first started hearing about deep brain stimulation when I was in college, it never was clear to me, well, what, what is it exactly is going in the brain? Is it a little chip? But it's a long wire with little contacts at the bottom of that wire where the electricity comes through. The electrodes that we use to actually localize where we put that relatively large electrode are about 10 microns in size, so you can barely see them. And before I implant them, I try to look at them almost under a microscope to make sure that they're straight, make sure that they're well aligned, and you can barely see them. So you can imagine how we can actually now probe the brain and listen to brain cells, uh, uh, but also not really induce any trauma to the brain, any brain damage or anything like that by doing these kinds of procedures. So this is how I picture this procedure. This is a microelectrode. You can see this tiny little wire, 10 microns in size, recording from a, a nucleus which has all these little neurons in it. And what's incredible is that this neuron is able to be, the, the, the electrical activity of this neuron is able to be converted into an audible signal. So you can actually listen not just to a brain region, but to the cells in that brain region, specifically one cell at a time. We call it single unit recording. What we know is that when we record from a single unit that's involved in your arm, and it exhibits a tremor-like characteristic, if we put the electrode in that region, we know you're going to have a great result. And that's why patients have to be awake for this surgery, or at least that what's, gives you the best opportunity for a good result. I have a, uh, a video with audio on it. Are we able to uh, connect that so that you guys can hear the uh, audible signal? This one here? Yep, that's the guy. So if you see this electrical pattern of firing activity, all those lines are demonstrating that this cell is just depolarizing and firing. The brain is an electrical circuit. So I've always said to myself, well, if it's an electrical circuit, can't you, lose ele can't you use electricity to make patients with brain conditions better? And the truth is you can. Essential tremor is the perfect example. So we take these electrical activities and we convert them using fancy electrical engineering techniques to audible signals. So we wear headphones during these surgeries. And what's funny is that patients are awake for these surgeries. I have a headphone on my head. The patient's talking to me. I can't hear anything the patient's saying. Um, so we actually have massage therapists during the surgery who are there to keep the patient comfortable. Again, the patients are awake, right? So to get through these kinds of surgeries, we found that actual massage therapy is actually very helpful. This is something that uh, we believe is a, a real asset to our program. But these massage therapists are also advocates for the patient. So they're the ones that wave to me and tell me that there's an issue and the patient has a question. Um, and so I can take my headphones off and, and actually have a conversation with the patient. So this is the procedure. So when you're lying in the bed, our neurologist is Dr. Bronte Stewart. She's uh, the director of the movement disorder program. She'll do a neurologic exam. She'll, she'll brush the skin and listen to the reactivity of the neurons that receive that information. This is tactile feedback telling us exactly, well, we're in the region we want to be in, but is this the region that controls the arm, the leg, the face, the voice, the neck? All of these questions we're able to answer. So here's a tremor, and you hear that tremor cell. And when you hear those tremor cells, and that's really what they're called, 
We'll put the electrode right in that location and we'll be so optimistic about it because we know when patients have that kind of audible signal, we know that electrode's going to be a really solid, sweet spot type electrode. The electrodes that are placed in the brain are long and thin, and they have all these extension wires that get connected under the skin to these little pacemaker-like devices. When pa whenever patients see the pacemaker, they always say, oh my gosh, that's so big. So I always say to patients, have you ever seen somebody with a pacemaker? And occasionally patients do, but many times patients actually have not seen other humans with pacemakers. Pacemakers are so common, so you have seen plenty of people with them, you just don't notice. And so the truth is with, with these kinds of devices, yes, it's possible you might see a little, um, a little device under the skin just because it's a little bit more pronounced than having no device there at all. But if you're not looking, you're not going to notice it. So uh, I do liken it to the pacemaker because the pacemaker is so common. But this is actually pretty common as well, and my guess is that at some point, when you guys are walking down the street or even at the beach, you are next to people that have these devices, but you don't even realize it. So these devices, the, the pacemaker-like devices placed under the skin one week after the implant, we like the patients to go home and recover a little bit from the first procedure. Uh, patients usually spend one night in the hospital and they're able to go home uh, and they feel great the next day. Uh, and we turn the device on about four weeks later. We like to wait for any inflammation uh, to go down, all the healing to take place before we turn the device on. So the final result is one or two batteries placed in the chest connected to these electrodes in the brain. One relatively new development is that these batteries can actually be a little bit larger and control both sides of the brain. So instead of having two batteries there, you can just have one. The next part of the deep brain stimulation experience is the programming. This is probably the more challenging part. Uh, at least I know the neurologist would argue that. Uh, it's a bit time consuming because you have to come into the hospital, you get the battery device turned on, but the electrode itself has multiple electrodes on it. That's why it's so confusing. So it's a wire with these four electrodes on the bottom of it. Those four electrodes are placed in the brain region of choice and each one can deliver the therapy. So we have options. It's almost like a medication and dosing. So when you go see your primary care doctor, you have high blood pressure, they give you a blood pressure agent. Sometimes you have to come back a week later to check your blood pressure. Maybe it's still high, so they give you a little bit more. Same thing's true here. So it's a little bit of a time-consuming experience, but we have a lot of experience with this now to try to expedite patients, uh, patients' care. So uh, in general, I don't find that patients feel this is a very cumbersome process, but it's definitely not a one pill, one dose, you're fixed kind of problem. This is a bit of a six month process where maybe you're back in the office two or three times during that six month period. So we know that deep brain stimulation improves tremor. I haven't shown you ev any data for this, um, uh, but uh, this is a standard of care, FDA approved uh, therapy uh, that many patients don't know about, yet it is absolutely available to you. It is standard of care. It's, it's, it's exceedingly rigorous and it's exceedingly safe. Uh, there are uh, developments that are being made in this procedure to improve targeting and comfort and these are things that we're trying to be leaders in. There are some negatives. I have only talked about the greatness of this, but there are negatives to always consider with any surgery. There's risk of infection. With brain surgery, there's always risk of headache, nausea, vomiting, even bleeding, but these risks are small. They're real, but they are small. And when you're considering something like this because you have debilitating quality of life, it's worth taking these small risks to do something for yourself. So pr plenty of my patients say to me, well, do I really need to be awake for this surgery? And so I say, well, I believe you do because I think that bodes for your best chance for a good outcome. So what are the patients saying to us when they've actually had this experience? They tell me, well, it was an invigorating marathon. So that sounds kind of bittersweet, I guess. Uh, so it's a long day, but it was invigorating and exciting, and all of these patients had great results. One patient said, that was amazing. One patient said, you gave me a gift. And so I think overall patients are having positive experiences, but they wish it was a little bit faster, and that's why we've developed these frameless devices that we think are giving us this opportunity to do these surgeries equally as safely, equally with uh, the same precision, if not better, uh, but with patients uh, being um, getting through that surgery a little bit faster. 
So I'm going to move ahead a little bit to a new development in surgical treatments for essential tremor uh, derived from the, the Greeks and the Romans where we learned such a long, long time ago that we could focus the energy of the sun to a small focal area. If you take a magnifying glass and a leaf and you let the sun shine its beams through it, you can burn a little hole in that leaf. And I did that when I was a kid and probably a lot of you did too when you were a kid. If you think about that kind of technology or that kind of technique, we have uh, applied that to a new technology called focused ultrasound sound, which is a high-tech, I am not an electrical engineer or any so, of any sort uh, or a physicist, but this is as, as cool as it gets. It's all part of a research trial that Stanford's a part of, but I just wanted you to know that there are, make, there are developments that are being made in the uh, treatment of essential tremor. Uh, deep brain stimulation is still the standard of care, but it is the treatment to beat with these kinds of research applications. This is uh, the device that is used. It looks a little cumbersome, yes, but this is just the sort of first phase one type device, and it's all part of research. But it is an uh, amazing opportunity to have a treatment for your central tremor. It's a direct brain treatment, but no incision is made. And you ask how you do that? Well, uh, the uh, high energy beams of the ultrasound are able to actually get through the scalp and get through the skull. Uh, without inducing any incision or any cutting. There's no knife involved. Uh, there's minimal anesthesia. You're, you're awake for the procedure, and it's in, in the MRI scanner, so you're getting real-time feedback from the MRI and the patient uh, about where in the brain we are in terms of these tremor cells. We're able to achieve this very safely. Uh, this is uh, a device that is being trialed in a multi-institutional trial that Stanford is a part of. There's many patients now in the country and worldwide that have had this therapy. But remember, it's still research. So when you're thinking about it as therapy, you have to be cautious because the downside of it, the durability of it, how long does it last, all of this is unknown But it is it, because it is part of a research trial. The MRIs that we're getting afterwards are demonstrating that we're getting in the right spot. The thalamus where the tremor cells are is getting targeted accurately and patients are having suppression in their tremor. This is what patients are looking like before surgery on the left and after the procedure on their right. And I call it surgery because there's still a lesion that's induced in the brain by this high frequency ultrasound. It's almost like it burns a very, very fine point in the brain where we find the tremor cells to be. The, the opposite of that is deep brain stimulation, which just releases electricity to a region, but doesn't actually cause an ablation. But it, there is an incision on the skin. So one is surgery, the other is a procedure, but in my mind, they're both surgery, uh, and they both have different risks. And I think that one day when this device is actually FDA approved, I think some patients will be good candidates for this, and some patients will be good candidates for deep brain stimulation. It's not going to be one or the other. Uh, this is uh, probably some of the only data that I'm going to be showing, uh, but this is uh, data from the trial that was done at UVA for this device, demonstrating that patients were having good results and they were having good results for one year, and now they're being followed in a long-term study. This is one patient uh, before his tremor. He was treated here at Stanford. Actually, this was done by my partner, Jimmy Henderson. This is after the treatment. We did have to shave his head. And that is almost normal. <laughs> and I know he's been very happy with his result. The treatment takes about, at this point, the treatment still takes about three to four hours, so he was probably hungry and thirsty by the end of it. <laughs> We're using MRI techniques now to try to refine our targeting. We have seven Tesla MRI. It's not the car Tesla, but it sounds cool, so we'll go with that. We're able to use these techniques to actually fine tune our targeting, both for focus ultrasound and for deep brain stimulation. This is a Stanford specific endeavor uh, that I'm thrilled to be a part of, though in no way was this any of my idea. This is developed by the brilliant people that are at Stanford University, and I'm along for the ride. But I'll be able to use this kind of technology in these surgeries to enhance our precision, our efficacy, and our safety. So, neurosurgery is not for everybody. Uh, I've always said that if I never have to do neurosurgery again because we have medical or other kinds of conservative options that I'll be happy to retire on that day. Uh, one example of this, if I, I've lost track of time, um, 
is, is liftware. Uh, this is something, is there volume for this? We don't need to show the whole video, but I wanted to just demonstrate. This is obviously patients with essential tremor and a device that was developed by um, uh, a, a startup actually here That's in the Bay Area that was actually bought by Google, no surprise. Um, and I'm, I'm going to fast forward it for a little bit so we don't have our our volume up, but this is available online on people YouTube to go out and on to Google. Restaurants. It's easy to find, but I just wanted to, you guys to know that there are options. So look at this spoon. Thank you. We're good. Yeah, bring it up. First time, we have the technology to actively stabilize a person's tremor in a device so small that it fits in your hand. So the tremor's still there. The spoon there. works by sensing a person's tremor and intelligently stabilizing itself to make the food's journey from the plate to the mouth much easier. Liftware is designed to be part of your life. The device is small and portable so that you can easily take it with you when you go out to eat. It's comfortable and effective because liftware allows your hand to shake while the cancellation technology in the handle stabilizes the spoon. It's proven to be effective. In clinical trials, we measured on average more than 70% reduction in tremor for different eating related tasks. It's easy. I'm going to move ahead from that. They're talking about how it's easy to put in the dishwasher and all these kinds of things because they want it to be easy to use. This is something that can be bought, I believe, on Amazon or on Google uh, and should be easy to find online if you guys are interested. Um, I'm interested in wearable technology. We think about wearable technology in terms of fitness, but why can't we think of it in terms of medical treatment? There's a company developed out of Stanford uh, that actually has a bracelet that they're trying to get FDA approved. It's now all research, but this, race, this, this bracelet is incredible. This bracelet's able to not only sense your tremor, but release electrical stimulation to your wrist, and they have data to find that actually it kind of works. So if you see on the, the left, there's a, a typical spiral that these patients are, are riding because of their tremor that's completely uh, 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 not uh, accurate and precise. And then with this bracelet therapy, again in, in a research trial, there's dramatic normalization of that tremor. We find that when we do it without deep brain stimulation, we have a pretty good result with deep brain, deep brain stimulation. The bracelet together with deep brain stimulation has the best result. And that's very much how I think of deep brain stimulation and just about any kind of therapy that I offer patients. There's never a, a home run therapy. It's always in combination. So deep brain stimulation plus medications. You might be able to come off a lot of your medications, but together you'll have the best result. Same thing's true for the bracelet. Deep brain stimulation, bracelet, and medications, all part of one treatment plan for patients to give the best possible result with the least amount of side effects. This is my transition slide, Elizabeth. So uh, uh, we recently published on a, uh, uh, the beginning of our endeavor to try to apply deep brain stimulation to vocal tremor. Vocal tremor is a component of essential tremor, and I'm going to let Elizabeth DiLorenzo uh, talk about all of that. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, Casey. That was wonderful. Um, I've heard versions of that numerous times, and every time it gets me really excited about what they're doing in neurosurgery as well as what we're doing together with neurosurgery as well as otolaryngology. So what I want to talk about a little bit uh, today is essential vocal tremor, which as Casey mentioned is a component of the essential vocal tremor process. But in order to understand vocal tremor, we need a little bit of a further understanding of the anatomy that contributes to causing a vocal tremor. And where this comes from is the voice box or the larynx. So the larynx is located here, as you can see, in your throat, and we can get a little bit of a close-up view. And what you'll really see is this is just essentially a series of cartilages that are attached together by elastic membranes. But these just cartilages with membranes do a lot of amazing things. For example, this is our organ for communication. Without our larynx, we can't produce voice. This is also a channel for air. If we hold our breath with our mouth open, that's at the level of our larynx. And finally, it's protection for our airway. So for example, every time we swallow, our larynx closes off. Has everyone kind of probably had that sensation of something going down the wrong pipe? No. Yeah, that's something going towards your larynx. So again, a really, really important organ, albeit small. So where we're really interested for the purpose of this talk and this presentation is the larynx in terms of an organ of communication for voice production. 
So to understand voice production, we need to understand the vocal folds, um, which is what we call them, but you probably heard them called the vocal cords. And these again are two membranous pieces of tissue, probably about the size of my pinky nail that sit inside the larynx. So in this image is if we took the larynx and we opened it up from the back, this is what we'd see inside. We see kind of these two membranous strips that I have labeled true and false. The true vocal folds are what are going to move and vibrate when we're making voice. Um, the false vocal folds, which are above that, are not actually used for voice, but instead more for just general airway protection. This is another view of our vocal folds. This is if we're looking from above, down, below. So this would be that V, you can see the V shape, where the V comes together at the bottom, that would be the front of the vocal folds. In the back, where they're open, that's the back of the larynx. And um, below that is actually our airway. So you can appreciate in this image here, the tracheal rings here actually leading down into our airway. The vocal folds have two general positions, either an open or abducted position, or a close or an adducted position. So how do we actually take a look at these to diagnose vocal tremor or to diagnose any other voice disorder for that matter? Well, we use something called laryngoscopy, where we actually take a camera, and this can either be done through the nose or through the mouth, and we can actually put this camera in this situation through the nose, as you can see here, through the lower nasal cavity, into the throat, and then shine a light into our voice box so we can actually, again, see the structures that make up our voice box as well as the vocal folds themselves. So this, let's take a look of what that looks like in action. So this is us going through the lower nasal cavity. We're now entering the back of the throat and that movement is actually the soft palate that you're seeing. And now we are into the throat and we're starting to look down into our voice box. So you can see below here, we can now see those two strips like we saw in those last pictures. These are the actual vocal folds themselves. And you could see a little bit further down, that leads right down into our airway, into our lungs. So it's one thing just to look at them, but again, in order to really assess a tremor in the voice, which we're clearly not gonna hear if we're not using our voice, we need to be able to look at how the vocal folds move. Volume now. So what now we're doing is putting on a special light called a strobe light. And this allows us to look at the vibration of the vocal folds in slow motion. So you can actually appreciate this wave-like movement. Let's just take a breath. Say e. Good. Just breathe. So this is healthy movement of our vocal cords. We don't see any lumps or bumps. Everything is fairly stable. Things aren't moving a lot. This is exactly what we want it to look like. So keep this in mind a little bit as we move forward and show you what it's probably not supposed to look like more. And then gas. Good. And E. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little biased, but. <laughs> so let's, let's move toward what we came here to talk about, this idea of essential vocal tremor. There's many, many types of voice disorders out there. And this one is a fairly common voice disorder that we see in the clinic. But as we'll talk about as I move forward a little bit, unfortunately, a very difficult to treat voice disorder. So what happens in essential tremor of the voice? Well, essentially, like in the limbs, there's an involuntary movement of muscles. This involuntary movement just happens to be in the muscles that are in and then around the voice box or the larynx. And what this rhythmic involuntary movement then causes is alterations in the pitch and then the loudness of the voice. With the pitch being, again, how high or how low we are and loudness, as we all know what loudness is, but again, we get these rhythmic fluctuations in that. And this is actually on this image here, a tracing of what 
alterations in pitch and loudness look like in essential vocal tremor. So you can see this really consistent wave in both the pitch and the loudness of the voice. So let's take a look at now about what this looks like. Volume. So you can see that movement right away. It looks like the whole voice box is kind of bumping up and down. One more time. And that voice is no longer stable. It's again kind of moving up and down. So this is that same light that I used before. And you lose some of that nice rhythmic wave movement, but instead see them kind of slapping together. So a little bit more about essential vocal tremor. This occurs in about 25 to 38% of patients with essential tremor. So this is not a minor occurrence. In fact, you know, you often, most patients we see with essential tremor have maybe some type of vocal tremor, let it be mild or more severe. Unfortunately, the impact of the vocal tremor is significantly underappreciated. So this results in reduced speech intelligibility, um, a lot of increased effort to produce your voice, as well as reduced voice-related quality of life. So you can imagine you're someone and you're still working, you're a teacher, you are in human resources. I mean, you have a job that you use your voice. You have a life where you use your voice. You wanna call and talk to your children on the phone or your grandchildren. And if you can't get your voice out, this can be really, really devastating. And unfortunately, like I said, this has been really kind of an ignored and not appreciated system, um, symptom of the essential tremor of the limbs. So how do we assess essential vocal tremor? Well, this is primarily between a combination of two professionals, a laryngologist who is an ear, nose, and throat doctor who specializes in care of the voice and swallowing, as well as a speech language pathologist like myself who specializes in the assessment and treatment of voice disorders. We take a detailed history of the patient. Often our patients are coming from our colleagues in neurology or someone like Casey here. Um, so we get a detailed history paying close attention to what other types of tremor they may have. Um, recently I've been getting patients who come in first complaining of their voice and then later on say, well, gosh, yes, I guess my hands are moving also, but it just happened to be the voice that they noticed first. So we pay attention to what medicines they're on for if they've been diagnosed with essential tremor already, what medicines they're on, what their type of treatments they have had. We do full instrumental assessments. So that image that you guys saw before of the voice box, we do that. We also do things like acoustics of the voice. So we look at the pitch and the loudness of the voice. We also look at aerodynamics of the voice. So airflow when they're producing their voice. So once we assess and then diagnose a patient with essential vocal tremor, where are we in terms of treatments? Well, as with essential tremor, often one of the first lines of treatment that we try is medication. And these are the medications that are also used for essential tremor of the limb. Um, we also, some people treat vocal tremor with Botox injections. So they'll actually put Botox into that muscle to paralyze some of the muscles of the voice to stop the tremor. A problem with that is that it's often not just one muscle that's oscillating, it's many muscles. And you can't paralyze everything in your throat without significant problems. So finally, also behavioral voice therapy is something we also do for vocal tremor, which is something I do personally. This works in some patients, but not others. So I would say for all of these treatments, these work in probably less than 50% of patients. And those patients that this do work in have typically a relatively mild limb as well as vocal tremor, which goes right back to where Casey started today, is that for these more severe patients, we really have n nothing to offer them in terms of the voice, which led us to our collaboration. So sh the first, I should tell you a brief story, the first day I started at Stanford, my, literally my first day here, by probably one o'clock in the afternoon, I was in the operating room <laughs> with, with Casey, who was doing a DBS surgery, trying to measure the voice of someone who was getting DBS for essential vocal tremor. So we know that you know, deep brain stimulation is a safe and effective therapy for essential limb tremor. 
but there's really been a limited number of case reports and case series that have ever investigated whether deep brain stimulation can actually be used as a treatment for essential vocal tremor. This should be considered given the number of patients who have co-occurring vocal as, as well as limb tremor. In these limited number of case reports and case series that we are seeing positive results, either an elimination or a significant reduction in essential vocal tremor, which really means that we should look at this more because at this point, we really have insufficient evidence whether or not we can actually recommend deep brain stimulation as a treatment for essential tremor of the voice. So towards that end, we have a research study currently in progress um, that we're working on together where we're actually studying the effectiveness of deep brain stimulation for essential vocal tremor. We're doing comprehensive assessments of voice as well as limb tremor before they have surgery, actually during their awake surgery, as well as various time points following surgery. So we get this really holistic view with the hope is that with a little time and a little extra effort from in between collaborations in neurosurgery, neurology, as well as otolaryngology as I'm in, is we can actually optimize the surgical placement of those electrodes to reduce both limb as well as vocal tremor. And the limited number of patients that we tried this with have been pretty happy too um, because they do complain about their voice and really no one's you know paying that much attention to it hopefully until us now so again i don't have a lot of data but here's just a little bit of an example of some preliminary findings that we have from one patient i'm going to have audio here now So this is after um, a patient of ours has had the deep brain stimulator inserted, um, and this is with right now the it off. So so do you appreciate the unsteadiness, the wave-like movement of that voice? And you can actually see that in the signal below here, where blue is the pitch of the voice, yellow is the loudest, and again you can see these up and down rhythmic modulations. Now, with the DBS switched on, a lot more stable, and you can see that in the signal here. And again, not quite perfect, but sure a heck of a lot better than where we started. So with that said, um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and hearing what we have to say and also thank Casey for including me in this to, to reach out a little bit about what we're doing as well as just to increase awareness of disorders of the voice, especially um, essential vocal tremor. So I think at this point in time, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Yeah, so is the DBS an either or limb or voice or you're actually able to address both the same. So our experience with vocal tremor is in its beginning, but uh, the three patients that we've treated uh, have been very positive. Uh, so I would say that, in fact, what we try to do is we focus on the arm. That is generally what the primary complaint is. The vocal tremor has not, we have not had a patient yet who told us their vocal tremor was their primary complaint. Mm -hmm. So we focus on the primary complaint. So we ensure that we get the arm uh, suppressed, the tremor uh, of the arm suppressed. As long as we've done that, then we have some flexibility for the voice. And what we found that there's actually single cells in the thalamus, in the brain, that, uh, in the brain region that we target for uh, essential tremor that control both voice and arm and even leg as well. So we're able to actually treat patients in ways that we never thought we would be able to do. Uh, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just, just briefly, is that I've been a part of the programming visits of some of these patients that we've done, and we found, again, this is very new, um, but with a little extra time and you know, with a good programmer and people who are ready and willing, that we can really find a great site that probably optimizes both the voice as well as the limb. But of course, with limb primarily being our first priority to make sure that's optimized first, given that's the primary complaint. But we're hopeful and we're excited about this. Absolutely. So these tremors are affecting mainly the limbs. Mm -hmm. So 
So if someone's uh, trembling a little with the, the head, is that totally different out of your ballpark? Or what? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you. So is that, uh, if someone's shaking with their head like yes. that, I know that may be a symptom of Parkinson's. Maybe, could be. But could it be something else within your area of expertise or Absolutely. So why don't I, I'm going to repeat your question for the uh, web audience. Uh, and then would you like me to actually repeat the other question we had, just, uh, just so everybody's aware? Sure. So uh, first, to answer, your, uh, to answer your question, which was, uh, uh, could we, I, I, I blanked for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> I literally said, you know, perhaps I can think of an intelligent way to explain why I'm pausing, but then I really just blanked. But, but I, I got it now. So the question was, uh, can we control head tremor, uh, head or neck tremor uh, uh, with deep brain stimulation? So like vocal tremor, historically, uh, these have not been the primary focus of our surgeries. And so the effectiveness uh, is a little unclear. Uh, we've had a lot of luck with the vocal tremor patients that we've treated. The head and neck tremor patients that we have treated, we have not had as much luck. But I suspect it's related to experience and awareness and the primary complaint that patients have. If a patient says to me that their head and neck tremor is more severe to them than their arm tremor, then I will spend the time during the surgery to ensure that we optimize the electrode for their head and neck while also trying to control their arm tremor. And I think that we'll be able to do both. But historically, patients have been told, you know, unfortunately, your head and neck and your vocal tremor you're going to have to live with. Uh, I don't think that's true, but I don't have a lot of evidence to prove that to you. But what I can say is that we've had some results uh, that are very positive uh, that suggest that we have the ability to control not just voice tremor but head and neck tremor as well. The other question was, can we control voice tremor and arm tremor? Just to clarify for the web audience, uh, uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, uh, although the vocal tremor experience is in its beginning here at Stanford, and broadly, uh, uh, we're quite confident that uh, we don't have to necessarily choose one or the other. Uh, but we do like to identify what the primary, most debilitating problem is first. Mm -hmm. Do um, any patients need to come back and have the DBS reinserted or, or modified or removed somewhere else in the brain? Given I've demonstrated my poor short-term memory, let's, talk, let's focus on the first question, uh, and then we'll go to the second one. Uh, the first one was a um, perfect example. <laughs> it's late in the day. I had an early morning with my two uh, baby children. So um, the ideal candidate for deep brain stimulation. So let's focus on essential tremor. Uh, because there are other kinds of conditions that have uh, deep brain stimulation as an option, Parkinson's disease, dystonia, even OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. But essential tremor specifically, I would say it's a patient who has poor quality of life related to their essential tremor that is at some point in their lifetime responsive to medication. Uh, in general, tremor that is not responsive to medication is very difficult to treat. Not that we're not willing, but we just know that if it has had never had a response to medication, it will be difficult to treat with anything, including deep brain stimulation, though we've had success doing that. It's never quite as good for a tremor that has been sensitive to medication in the past. Paper, people always ask me, what about age? So essential tremor is frequently seen in young adults. Uh, obviously, uh, it stays for, for the lifetime of the patient, so we see it in elderly as well. Parkinson's disease, for example, is more frequently seen in slightly older age population. I don't have an age cutoff for the surgery at all. It's all about the patient's medical health. Uh, so a healthy patient with debilitating essential tremor uh, that perhaps w at one point was medically responsive, uh, uh, I would say, is the ideal patient for this. Yeah. Second question. No. <laughs> I, I, I really, I think I need my own deep brain stimulation. <laughs> if there's ever um, a situation where you need to actually go back in and oh. insert or, or move the DBS to a, another part of the brain. Yes, I had to do that recently actually for a patient. It's not often. What I usually tell patients is there's probably a 5 to 10% chance for the need for further surgery in the future. And I think that's actually a high 
um, a high number. I don't think that that's actually the true number for it, but I want patients to be aware that if you're going to get surgery, we're going to do the surgery awake to ensure precision. If we do it awake, the chance of it is probably lower. If we do the, the surgery asleep under general anesthesia, the need for a revision down the line is probably a little bit higher because we don't have that real-time feedback for the patient in terms of is their tremor better, do they have side effects. The patient that uh, we recently implanted was not for vocal tremor, it was actually for Parkinson's disease. Uh, this patient had Parkinson's dystonia. Because of her dystonia, she could not get the surgery uh, awake. She was asleep for the entire operation. We implanted the electrode based on imaging alone. We had very good accuracy. She actually had a wonderful result for her motor component. She didn't have tremor, but she had dystonia, a different movement disorder, but another movement disorder. Uh, she had a wonderful result, but at the dose that she needed for the improvement in her motor disorder, she had a side effect of numbness, and she found it to be troubling. And we, we looked at the MRI. We thought we could do better, so we offered her a revision of her, of her previous surgery. So we did it one month later, and uh, the electrode is, is in now, and she's doing great. So uh, there is a chance for it. It's not high. Um, and I would say that if it's needed, we certainly can address it and make it better. For sure. Mm -hmm. What does the vocal cord, the vocal the tremor sound like? Sure. Not the electronics of it, but if, if you or I or somebody had, what would we have our So, yes. So the question was, what does a vocal tremor sound like, essentially? Not the electronics of it, but just in general, what does it sound like in the voice? I can give you my best impression. Um, <laughs> also, and we can also think about it as a little bit of akin to an, a vibrato in the voice for those who are familiar with singing, that um, that's just a purposeful oscillation, but uh, uh, may be what it sounds like during a sustained vowel. During just typical speaking, it might sound like someone is struggling to get their voice out. You have, because you're not just sustaining a single sound in continuous speech, you're not gonna hear quite so much those rhythmic oscillations. But if you noticed, when we watched that one, the, the video of the vocal fold vibration during the tremor, you didn't see this nice smooth movement of the vocal folds. Instead it was a little bit choppy and halted. And that's what it translates to when you hear it in the voice. You're welcome. <coughs> this is just because I have a brother who had spinal stenosis mm -hmm. surgery, and I wonder if there's any connection. I know there's connection with everything we have, but is there a connection between that and brain tumor? So is there, I'm gonna really repeat this quickly so I don't forget it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so embarrassing. So uh, the question was, uh, is there a link between spinal stenosis and the brain? And I wanted to ask you a follow-up question on that. It was, is this in somebody who also has tremor? No, not to my knowledge. Okay. Just, you know, he might, you know, sure. move in that direction. I don't know. Sure. So uh, I would say about 25% of my practice is spine surgery. So I, I do a, a, a small component uh, of spine surgery in my practice. Uh, spinal stenosis is a very common problem. It's essentially arthritis in the neck or in the lower back. It can cause arm pain, neck pain, but it's below the brain. The brain is connected to the spinal cord. The brain sends neurons and big white matter bundles down through the brain stem, to the bottom of the brain, to the bottom of the skull, down into what they call the spinal cord. And so what's around that spinal cord are um, uh, vertebral bodies and discs, the spinal column, and you can develop arthritis during your lifetime, and as you get older, you get more arthritis, but everybody has some component of it. It's essentially normal, but like a central tremor, it's a spectrum. So some can be very severe, some can be quite mild, but the severe ones can have severe symptoms, r ranging from weakness, pain, a whole combination of things. Um, I've seen some overlap with tremor and spinal stenosis in patients who may develop a tremor after a car accident, and a car accident may have induced a weakness in an arm because of underlying spinal stenosis, but otherwise I'm not aware of any significant link between those two kinds of disorders. Parkinson's disease, however, has a known association with spinal disorders related 
likely to their muscular disorder that's a little bit more diffuse than a central tremor. Uh, so in Parkinson's patients, we frequently see spinal stenosis. Many of these patients are getting spine surgery. We're very interested in actually treating Parkinson's patients primarily for their condition to try to ameliorate their spinal problems, and we're having good results with that. Uh, but with a central tremor, the link is a little bit less clear. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, it looked like in one of those slides that you were aiming for a particular neuron. I don't think that's exactly right. And then you showed a, a probe which has uh, four different uh, four different connections on it. Yes. And I also know that as you age, your uh, transmission speed down the nerves is slowed down. <laughs> So I'm guessing that uh, this frequency here that causes this tremor in the arms that some people have might be to the speed of different nerves uh, lose their, um, lose their, what's the word, uh, coordination, lose their synchronicity or lose their mm -hmm. timing to cause this thing. Does that sound feasible that, uh, that this, this, the increased slowness and each nerve sending out to, each nerve in the brain sending out a signal down the nerves to try and move a certain muscle in the arm. And these, mus these signals would get there out of phase and you would have a tremor. So I think that could be a component of, I have to repeat your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh darn it. So I think I, can, I think I can do it because this was a really, really good question and I want to ask you what your background is too. So the first was, can we target single neurons are we actually really trying to do that? Are we, are we just getting there and are we lucky? The electrode that we implant has four contacts on it. Those contacts are a lot bigger than that little tiny electrode, so how is that able to target those single cells? And then the third component of the question was, is the reason that we're getting these kinds of tremor disorders related to the fact that these single units are getting impaired in age differentially such that we have this imbalance of the arm? Is that differential speed because they all fire the and body are yes. the same age but um, if, you, if you get a signal from two different um, nerves in the, in the thalamus uh, and they're not um, I keep, uh, you know, synchronized or uh, coordinated correctly yeah. the nerve the muscle down here will get a uh, distorted signal so uh, the question is can or I should say, the, this, I'm trying to understand your question well, because this is a very good question. You're pushing me here. It's late in the day. <laughs> so is the tremor in the arm related to the variance in nerve transmission that is partly related to aging cells? The speed uh, at which they fire. So I, the truth is I don't know. Um, there's a lot of research uh, that uh, has been done here and worldwide uh, at multiple incredible institutions trying to understand why we have Parkinson's disease and why we have essential tremor, how these conditions vary, because maybe the differences in them will help explain how these diseases come about. Um, I think the essential tremor uh, research is more geared towards trying to understand the link between the cerebellum, one motor center of the brain, and the thalamus, the other motor center, because the connection between those two centers seems to be abnormal in a central tremor. That's the research I know most about. I don't know a lot about the research connecting the brain to the wrist, but we do have evidence from devices like that bracelet, which I told you about that we're researching, that we can access nerves somehow in the wrist that can then indirectly get to the tremor center in the brain. Um, it doesn't answer your question because I actually just don't know the answer, but it is a really good question and a wonderful hypothesis to a research endeavor that I'd be willing to tackle with you. <laughs> if I have to carry a heavy weight for a long distance, it used to be easy, but now the motor neurons right across here, mm -hmm. they hurt. I mean, carrying a heavy weight, it used to be easy, the same distance now, that those, you, you know the motor neurons are right across like that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else do you know have that feeling? Not that I know of. <laughs> Not that I know of. We should talk more about this. <laughs> yeah. You were, you were up first earlier. Um, does, after the DDS is implanted, does the patient need to do anything in terms of maintenance? And does the person feel anything happening when the DDS is activated? So uh, the question is, uh, after the implant, does the patient have any maintenance to do? 
And the second component was, I wanted to ask you, was, do you mean after it was turned on? Yeah. So um, does the patient have any sensations after the device is turned on? Um, in terms of maintenance, immediately after the surgery, there's some wound care that's probably in order, though very simple. Uh, and we give uh, a variety of wound care instructions to help ensure that these wounds don't get infected. I would say infections is probably the biggest hurdle that we have with any kind of device surgery. Whenever you put a device under the skin, you have probably about a 5% risk of infection. I think the infection rate at Stanford is a little bit lower than the national average, but not much because the truth is you can't prevent every single infection, uh, but we prevent a lot of them. Um, other than wound care and just being careful, patients feel pretty much at their baseline after these surgeries. So regarding the device, I would say the responsibility at that point is uh, on us to ensure that patients come back in to see us. We turn the device on at one month, and then there are usually follow-up visits a month after that, three months after that, six months after that, and usually those visits are not as necessary further down the line once we figure out the what I like to call the sweet spot of stimulation parameters. Uh, it's essentially like finding the right dose for your blood pressure medication. Once we find the dose, you can be a little bit more um, relaxed with your patients, and patients don't need to come back and see you so much. We usually find a pretty good dose the first time. Three months later, we get better. Six months later, we're usually where we need to be, um, if not before then. What the patient needs to do for maintenance is actually not, not quite much in the early phase. About two years after the implant is when we start thinking about when the battery needs to be changed. In a central tremor, because tremor's there all the time, and it's usually a very high amplitude type tremor, it requires a lot of battery life. And so the, the batteries currently only last about three years on average. So around two years, it's sort of on the responsibility of the doctor and the patient to ensure that those batteries are getting checked. Uh, and that can happen um, at, at a primary care visit. Um, it can also happen somewhat remotely because we can predict the level that the battery will be at based on the settings that we make in the, in the office. So uh, there's a variety of ways we do that, and we have a lot of, uh, a lot of luck with it. Um, what we don't want is for that battery to shut off automatically. Um, it's not a life-threatening emergency, but obviously these symptoms come back that you may not have had for a long time. And so I've seen patients who went from having severe essential tremor to mild to no essential tremor, having a malfunction with their battery for whatever reason. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen. The tremor comes back, and the patient is so frantic because all of a sudden they're, they're they have to cope. They're, they're worse, worse. exactly. Yeah. They have to cope with this problem that they thought was never going to be a problem for them again. So, uh, so what I always tell patients is, remember, this is not a cure. This is a device that we're going to rely on to help you. We can put the device in the right place. We can program the device, and you can do everything you can to ensure that you come to these visits. But it is a device, and as we know from our phones and our computers, sometimes these devices can fail us, so we just need to be ready for it. Yeah. I'm taking, you know, the pills you mentioned now, okay. but it will gradually get worse as I get older. So you're taking the, the pills now that we mentioned, pro propranolol. That's usually the first line. Primidone is another great option. Yeah. Gabapentin is another. I'm not a neurologist, so I don't prescribe these normally, but I'm familiar with them. Um, these are good medications. So patients with essential tremor do typically get worse in their uh, lifetime. Yeah, and then I have my bad days and good days. You fluctuate. I, I, yeah. I wipe it up. I don't really make a big deal out of it. Right. I'm bad at Jimmy Bars and Sunday, <laughs> you know, meth. Yeah. The, these medications work wonders um, for people with... Well, with the pills, I'm better than I was. You're better with the pills yeah. than without. Then that's a win. Yeah. Then that's but a win. This is... I came... If not, I have another option, if, if, you know... The, like, the question you have to ask yourself do is... Do you recommend it at a, in a certain time, or, or...? I generally tell patients if they feel regarding what time they should consider further treatments. Uh, what, what I generally tell patients is if you're on a medication regimen and you're at the best dose that you can be and you still have poor quality of life and you feel like you could do better as soon as possible, there's no reason to wait. Some doctors will say, it's not worth it right now, wait. I don't, I don't understand that. If you've decided you need something, might as well get it as soon as possible. Do you think there'd be an, an application of deep brain surgery to people with spinal cord injury? 
So will there be an application of deep brain stimulation for spinal cord injury? So there is a lot of interest in this. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in that. Um, but spinal cord injury is a very large problem. What part of the spinal cord, all of these kinds of things. So if we think about high spinal cord injury in patients who uh, have no function of their limbs but are aware otherwise, their brain works fine, but the rest of their spinal cord does not, so they cannot move their arms and their legs. There are a lot of individuals that are trying to develop new brain stimulation-like devices, not necessarily deep brain stimulation, but direct electrical brain therapies for these kinds of individuals. So, yes, absolutely. Is it the doctor's responsibility? I go into him as a patient, you know, for a regular visit, and he notices that I have a little tremor or something. Is it his or her responsibility maybe to obviously make me aware of it and, and recommend something or what? Or does he or she stay quiet? So is it the doctor's responsibility <laughs> to... Uh, not that we're implying anything here. So, so is it the doctor's responsibility to identify and inform you of a tremor that you may have? Yeah. I would say, of course. You know, like I said, it's such a common problem and there's a spectrum that a number of individuals might wait for you to comment on it t uh, to them because a lot of people are very embarrassed by their tremor, unfortunately. So they, not that they cover it up, but they don't seek out help because they're embarrassed by it or they just don't think there's any help that's out there for them. The truth is there is, and there's a lot of people that would like to help those kinds of patients. So it depends on the situation and your relationship with your doctor. So I don't want to say that that doctor should have said something. Uh, but obviously if there's... Right, right. But, but, but obviously if there's an obvious problem, I would certainly point it out to you or ask you about it. If it was somewhere where I wasn't certain, I might try to get to know you a little bit and see why you're not telling me about it. It's also possible you might not even realize it. So um, it just depends on the situation. Good question, though. Is the mechanism of those drugs uh -oh. understood? Do they upregulate or downregulate some hormone or something? Oof. <laughs> I, so the mechanism of the three medications is it understood, propranolol, primidone, and gabapentin. And I don't want to waste your time. It's not my area of expertise. But I would say, the, I would say yes, the mechanism is partially understood. But it's like any medication. Once you take that pill, it gets into your body and gets absorbed. We think we know what it does, but it doesn't necessarily do that. And that's why we have, you know, a lot all these clinical trials of medications that don't work, but they worked in mice, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we don't always know, but there are definitely some level of understanding for those three medications. But it's just not my area of expertise. So, yeah. Um, there's a correlation between the arm essential tremor and the voice essential tremor? Sure. Well, I, I think that we don't, we have a better, actually, I think in general, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the really the neurocorrelates of tremor in general are understood better for the limb, mm -hmm. but understood very poorly for the voice. We think, given that when we target sites for the limb and we're seeing an improvement in the voice also, that the, the tremor um, areas may be similar. But, you know, right now we actually, we don't know. And we're hoping as this moves forward to actually do some more mapping, deep brain mapping with our neurology colleagues to really try to figure out how closely these areas actually are related because we really don't have a good idea at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I know you had a question back there. Now, speaking of these four electrodes, can you describe the signal which is sent to the electrodes and how it's distributed amongst them? So um, how is the signal uh, distributed to those electrodes? What's the question? Describe the signal. Describe the signal. How is the uh, signal distributed and received by these four electrodes. So these electrodes are not recording electrodes. The recording electrode is that <clears throat> small 10 micron electrode that uh, we place uh, prior to placing the permanent deep brain stimulation lead in order to search for different single neurons that we think are responsible for the vocal tremor or the arm tremor or both. Uh, once we do that, we then implant the final deep brain stimulation electrode. There are research deep brain stimulation electrodes that are 
um, available in research trials uh, that are able to record. I, I don't know the details of those trials, though there, there is one happening here with one of our neurologists. Uh, but um, otherwise, I'm not able to answer that because I'm not aware. Electronic pulse generator. What is the, can you describe the pulse it generates? It is a uh, biphasic square pulse. Uh, for deep brain stimulation, for central tremors, typically high frequency at around 130, 140 hertz. It does vary. We can go as high as 200. We can go as low as 60. There's some evidence that for some movement disorders, a high frequency is better than a low frequency, but vice versa for other movement disorders or other types of, or other features of certain movement disorders might be better with low frequency than high frequency. This is all research. It's not standard of care. A little bit. Um, there's a lot of interest here at Stanford. One of my colleagues, Helen Bronte Stewart, is very interested in this topic. She, if, I, if she were here, she would wow you with brilliance because she, what? the truth is she is just, she's on the top of her field and we're working uh, with her to support this. But there are, you know, really leaders in developing devices uh, that are not only able to capture signals, the signals that you're asking about, but to use those signals in ways to trigger stimulation in a customized fashion. Because as I mentioned, some movement disorders respond well to a certain frequency or a certain pulse width. Uh, others respond to different ones. And so right now, they all get essentially the same thing, high frequency electrical stimulation, 60 microsecond pulse width, something like that. It's not ideal, but it works quite well for now. But we have room for improvement. Yeah. Very sophisticated audience. <laughs> yes? I've noticed I have a pump that has a frequency about that makes it sound about the same frequency as my tremor. I found my tremor, tremor will synchronize to the sound of the pump. You have a pump uh, which releases. You know, it's, a, it's extraneous to my, you know, it's for a, a machine. I see. It makes a sound. The tremor will become synchronized to that sound. You have a pump that has a frequency that your tremor synchronizes to. Yeah, the sound of the pump. That is pretty incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, well said. Okay. This is a case report. <laughs> What happens when you shut the pump? If you, if you shut the pump off, does the tremor go away? No. Oh. Just an idea. Interesting. That's a very interesting. I, I, I've never heard of that kind of problem. What kind of problem? I don't know. <laughs> Have you reported this to your neurologist? I, I'm not that far down the, the, that road. Well, we've got to go down this path with you. <laughs> well, I, I know what this thing is. It's an aluminizing tank. And uh, the pump is a vacuum pump. And you can hear it sitting in his garage. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's, the, it's the noise, it's the rhythmic noise of the pump huh. that he's describing as synchronizing with his tremor. You know, there, there is some ability for patients to have some control over their tremor so that, you know, whether you're, whether you're just trying to cancel out your tremor, sort of like that liftware device, there's some ability to do that. Um, so that tells me that there is a conscious level to everybody's tremor, and I wonder if somehow this pump is sort of getting into your consciousness in a way that you're able to express it in your tremor. Interesting. Well, we have to hear more about this. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the doctor. Our pleasure. Thank you.